Thank you, Melissa. It's great to be here. It's great to be back. Sarah and Ken, it's good, good to, to see you. Good to see um, you. Since we're never yeah, together, we don't want to see each other this way. Um, <laughs> You're always in a box. Always yeah. in a box. Yeah, we're going to break the box. We're going to break out of the box today. Um, so we're continuing this series of conversations on calling and vocation. And uh, today we want to just talk about this question, how do we find meaning in our work? And um, Let's start with just this idea is, is how, how helpful is this question about fulfillment and is fulfillment a good guide uh, for us as we, as we think about this? And um, we just, just to lay our cards on the table, we want to say, not really. Um, it's highly overrated as a guide for figuring out what's meaningful in our work. And I'll tell you why. Um, one is because the word is undefined. So what do we mean when we say fulfilling? Do we mean uh, gives me joy? Does it mean it makes me ecstatic? Do we mean it's fun? Um, we really don't define fulfilling. Like how, how, what percentage of it has to be fulfilling for it to ring the fulfillment bell? So it's a fuzzy, shifting kind of category from the gate. Um, second, the second thing is that many of us already know this, that the only way you get to do something fulfilling is by slogging through something that's unfulfilling. <laughs> you know, like you <laughs> you go to school so you can go and do this thing or you practice your instrument so you can play the solo or, you know, there's an element of unfulfilling that almost always leads to fulfilling. And most of the people we admire who have achieved things have worked really hard at, at, at a process that's probably not super fulfilling. A, th a third thing is that even if you find fulfilling and like sometimes the language of the, of the career world is find your dream job it's highly likely that either your dream or the job will change. So, you know, We're both. yeah, right. That's right. And, you know, you find out like it's the perfect company, the perfect fit, but then somebody moves on or the market changes or the technology gets altered and it's, you know, it's, it's not the same, or you just over time feel like your desires shift. And then there's one more big one guys. And you said this yesterday when we were thinking about this, but I'll just let one of you just chime out. There's one more big reason why fulfilling is just really not the, the right way to go. Sarah, you're leaning in. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> What's missing? Say it or if I was going to say it. The problem with fulfilling is it puts me at the center instead of God. And all throughout scripture, we see that we as people are objects, objects of God's mercy or objects of God's wrath, God's wrath. But we're never the subject right? God is the subject. He is the main part of the story, the main part of the sentence. Grammatically, God is the subject. And when we talk about fulfilling, we're talking about putting me at the center. And so I think the, 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 the problem with that is it's a, it's a person-centric, it's a me-centric view, as opposed to God-centric. The narrative is about God and his unfolding will in the narrative of the world as opposed to my unfolding will yeah. well said yeah okay. and it's one it's what happens when you're when you get saved is you realize that your life is actually not about you that you're part of a much bigger story and that's actually more of an adventure yeah so so let's figure out how we push past just saying is it fulfilling or not to a more effective way to find meaning in our work and the first part of this is actually going to sound a little bit like maybe a little bit of a contradiction, because we are going to talk about our experience of work. And one of the things that we want to suggest is that our experience of work kind of happens on a continuum. Um, and the first side of the continuum is chore work. When I was a kid, um, well, I like to think, maybe all of you do, I like to think I was raised right. I was given chores and like taking out the trash and clearing the table. What's that, Sarah? Is that a chore chart for your house? Yes, is my daughter's responsibilities chart. And all oh, I'm so text. glad. I am so glad that um, I was just told I had to take out the trash. Let me just say that. Um, <laughs> but you're all over it. You're, you're, you're way better organized than my mother was. But and maybe all three of us as a team have to get to live out the consequences of that. But um, <laughs> anyway, chore work is the work we have to do so we can do what we want to do. It's the work we have to do so that we can get to do what we want to do. So before I could go play, I had to, you know, clear the table and take out the trash and then I could go play. 
And some of us actually never grow out of that mindset about work. You know, work is always the thing we have to do to get to do what we want to do. And, you know, some, like you guys at Faith and Work Chicago, you're doing great work to say, no, 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 no. Work is what we're part of, what we're made for. It hooks us into God's story right from creation. And it's important for us to remember that. But our experience of work, sometimes work is, it's, it's, it's drudgery. It's hard. It's frustrating. It's chore work. But the other thing that, ha- that I thought about is that when I was a kid, there was another kind of work I did that I didn't even think was work at all. And that was, um, I used to build tree houses and they weren't like the fancy kind that you buy, like you see on TV or that you get the kid at Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that. They were more like uh, two boards with a piece of plywood on it in a tree. Um, definitely did not meet OSHA standards. Like there's no question about that. Um, <laughs> But the whole process of building one of these tree houses was actually a lot like work. Like we had to get organized and we had to find wood and we had to sneak dad's tools out of the cellar and we had to find nails and there was cutting and pounding and climbing and effort. And there was usually some cuts and scrapes and smashed thumbs in the process too. There was actually a little bit of pain. It just didn't matter. It didn't feel like work at all. And we use treehouse is a metaphor of describing work where there's a sense of flow. Um, that's actually a technical term. It refers to situations where there's, uh, we have a, a sense that our skills are rising to meet an increasingly challenging sense of demand. And so, there, you know, I don't know if you guys feel like you're just so focused on what you're doing. It's challenging. It's engaging. You sometimes get chills running up and down your spine and you could just work for hours in a state of flow. You don't even need to eat, uh, often, you know, you just, you get into that zone. And so this is how we experience work. It's on this continuum between chore and treehouse. That's, that's for us. That's, that's what it's like for us. The second side of this thing, which would be the, the vertical axis is how do we approach our work? Like, how do we frame it? And um, all of this is going to net out, net out for us four meanings of work. I promise we're going to get there. A secular approach to work And I mean approach. I mean the way you see it. I don't mean like saying some jobs are secular and some jobs are sacred. In fact, last week we kind of blew up that idea that some jobs are good and some jobs are bad. Um, And you can go back and check that out. I think the video is on the website. So uh, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the way we see or frame our work. And a secular approach to work is that work is something that is for me and by me. Like the ultimate goal of it is to provide for me something. Uh, whether it's the means to live or back to fulfillment again, it's for me. But the other thing that's really interesting is it's by me. It's all up to me to make it work. Uh, it's all up to me to have the skills and the, the, the strategy and the abilities and the courage. And, and it's all on my shoulders to make it happen. So that's secular work. Um, I'm alone in the universe making it happen. That's a secular approach to work. A sacred approach to work you know, I see my work through the lens that this is happening in God's world under God. It, we, I mean, yeah, there's some for me benefit to it, no question about it, but there's so much more to it. So I get to do my work for God. You know, this is Colossians 3.23, do your work for the Lord. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's more important who you do it for. Uh, do your work for God. Um, I mean, for others is something that it's the third one there. Um, but we all, we get that, love your neighbor, like work is a way to love our neighbor. And we have many different kinds of neighbors who are all stakeholders in the work that we do. But the, probably the most interesting to me is to think that a sacred approach to our work is the work that we actually get to do our work with God. That God is working in the world. And if, if, you're, if you're church people, you think that God is working in the world to save people from their sins and all that. And we, be, we all believe all those things. But God, that's true. And that's kind of like the big story. That's, in some ways, that's the eternal story or the bigger story. But Part of that story is that there's three other things that God is always doing in the world, and he invites us to do them with him. And uh, they are create, protect, and provide. And they're from a couple Psalms. So the Psalm 127 says, if the Lord doesn't build the house, the builders build in vain. And so it's this idea that anytime we're building or making or creating, God is there building and making and creating. And in Hebrews 3, it says God is the builder of everything. It's kind of any of you are in any anytime you're doing bringing something new to whatever work you're doing, uh, that's a with God creating kind of space. Um, the second is that we protect unless the Lord guards the city, the sentries guard it in vain. And like anything you're doing that saves rescues people from disorder, danger, uh, risk, 
some of you probably in finance, if you're doing risk insurance, you know, we don't think that's, that's super important. Well, actually it's protecting anything that's protecting God is guarding the city. And then the last is just providing that God is providing for all that we need. There's some, a number of scriptures of that. Talk about that. Psalm 104, Acts 17, Acts 14. And some of us just, our work provides things that people need. Um, so God's doing those things, but he's not doing them, you know, just directly supernaturally does them through our work. So secular, sacred, chore, treehouse. What do you think, guys? I mean, we're going to get into the, what, the meaning of work, but a few comments here before we keep going. Well, I, um, I love how you parsed out the secular and sacred, that these are approaches to work. We're not saying that specific work is secular and specific work is sacred, which we talked about last week, which means that if somebody is working for a church or a faith-based nonprofit, which traditionally we might think of as sacred work, you can have a secular approach to your work in church work, yeah. in ministry, in Jesus work. And you can take that secular approach of for God, partnering with God for the benefit of others into, into the marketplace. So I, I like that these are approaches to work and not categories of work. Ken, you're muted. And Ken, yes. I love what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> See, Sarah's yes. so much nicer. She says she'd love to hear what you're saying. I just say, Ken, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. Um, that's okay. I, I, um, when I listen to sacred and secular, secular sounds tiring to me. It's all up to me. I have to make it happen. There's something sort of tense about that. My, my stomach sort of tightens, my shoulders get tight. Um, and I'm, I'd like to think that if I'm working with God, that he's carrying the bulk of the burden uh, to get things done. Yeah, somebody important said something about his burden being light and his yoke being easy. Yes. And the, the yoke is actually a tool of partnered work, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then we're back to the with idea. Yes. That's good. We need to include that in a future presentation. I like that. Um, we're making it up as we go. Um, not really. Uh, anyway, um, Ken, that's a perfect setup for filling in our chart in terms of how the different meanings we can experience in our work. And so when we take a secular approach to our work, a for me, by me approach to our work, and we have to do chore work, which is probably what 95% of the people in the world have to do. Um, our work is a grind. You just said it, you said it's exhausting. It's a grind. It wears us out. It's a necessary evil. We're working for the weekend. We're working for retirement. We complain about our work. We hate our work. And we see no point in it except for our, the compensation that we get. Um, what's interesting is that there are a group of people anyway that get, they, they get to do treehouse work, but they approach it from a secular point of view. And then guess what? Work becomes your God. Your work is your religion. It is, it is the center of your identity and your source of security. and um, you know, it, it rules your life, but it's almost more like an addiction. A pot, like you get, you always get, you get something out of it. I, I, I think I was in Inc. Magazine. I was reading that people, somebody just said, well, I love to work all the time. I, it's, it's where I feel fulfilled. It's where I feel powerful. Um, what else is there to do? And um, it's, it's interesting, you know, sometimes we associate workaholism with um, some sort of deprivation or demand and it can be but sometimes it's just that's where we feel strong and so that's what we well, do it's also what we call an applauded addiction mm. you know if, if we value the work and we think it's good then we celebrate workaholism right. and, and how that becomes an idol in people's yeah. lives yeah so if i'm approaching work in a for me by me frame it's either going to be a grind or a god and um you know, there's a phrase in the Old Testament that says, when you worship an idol, you become like it. You become deaf and mute, just like it. Like that, you just, It sucks the life out of you eventually. And we get that grind would suck the life out of us, but the same thing is true when we make, it, make our work our God. So let's move on to the sacred approach to work. And um, when we have to do chore work, but we approach it with a sacred frame, that work is, becomes about growth. And... This is really important because uh, there's so much pressure to find the right job, uh, to get in the right lane, 
Um, sometimes we have a very low tolerance for challenge and suffering in, our, in, in general, but especially in our work. And we just think it's a waste of time. Again, back to it's not fulfilling or it's not feeling right. And, you know, it may only be temporary talking about this job, but it's never wasted uh, when you approach it and for God, with God, for others. Like there's always people to serve. There's always something God is doing. Um, you know, sometimes in, in the faith and work world, we treat Colossians 3.23 like it's sort of elementary. But when you really think about that, where it says you do your work for the Lord and he will reward you, it's tremendously liberating. Um, it just takes a lot of the pressure off to, I've got to be doing the right thing. It's kind of, no, you just need to be doing it with the right motive for the right, for him. And then it's, it matters automatically. And so we think, you know, verses like all things work together for those who love God. And um, whenever you experience hardship in Hebrews 12, it's take it as God's, we, the word is discipline. It's really a schooling. He's really forming you and really shaping you. And so the chore jobs that you have or the chore tasks that you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis are not wasted. If you look at this, they have meaning. They are, they're about your growth and about shaping your character. And then uh, the last box, um, the golden box uh, is gift. Some, when we get to do treehouse work and we approach it as a sacred, from a sacred frame, it's a gift. And this is a refrain that you know, it's only it's one of the very few positive things that's said in the book of Ecclesiastes. And it says over and over again, actually, if you get to enjoy your work, if you get to enjoy the, the fruit of your hands, it's a gift from God. It's a gift. And so this is kind of the way we lay this out. And we think that there's these four possible meanings. And so much of it has to do with um, how we approach it. I want to make one comment and then invite Sarah and Ken to chime in. And that's that. It's, it can be, we're, we're not necessarily saying that this job or this career is a chore job or career, and this job or this career is a treehouse job or career. We're saying that sometimes that could be true, but probably what's more realistic is that most of us will have chore and treehouse elements to all of our work, and that it's always going to be a mix. And the beauty of this way of approaching it. Um, of really understanding the meaning of our work and the greater context of God's story is that whether it's a chore day or a treehouse day or a chore task or a treehouse task, it still matters. And I think that's the power of what we're suggesting. Comments? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to what you talked about with the discipline aspect of chore work when, when we partner with God and it's, and it's a sacred sacred partnership it becomes that that discipline um, and discipline and disciple have the same root word in english right so it's all right. about we we can discipline like an athlete or we discipline um like we discipline children the whole goal being this training in righteousness sort of to 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 form character or form practice in somebody um, and a disciple there to, to form and reform the presence of that who they're studying. And so I like that um, idea of growth being part of our formation, um, which might be getting through the chore, getting through the drudgery might lead us into that treehouse, that flow effect of embracing those growth seasons where work is hard Yeah, um, and, and seeing what, what does God have for me in this? It's good. It's formation. Yeah, it's forming. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And it, it brings up for me the time when I was in college and I was doing a chore job. It felt like a 100% chore, to your point, Chip, about some jobs having a mix of the two. And it was, um, there was a gap in the software. So the only way to take these documents from one format to another was to meticulously go in and find these tags and search and replace. And I was doing this for hundreds of documents for an English department in a college. And by the end of the summer of doing this, I was just pulling my eyes out. And yet, looking back on it, I developed two really important skills out of that growth. One, I ended up being uh, involved in web design where HTML coding and tagging stuff was really important. And my ability to spot and, and notice things was really improved. And secondly, I had a lot of empathy for people when the software doesn't work. And that made me a better uh, IT consultant. So I didn't feel that at the time. It felt like drudge, right. it felt like chore. But 
holding on to that bigger picture, like God's doing something in my life. I don't know what it is. He's in charge. And later I reaped many benefits from, from the growth that came from that chore. So sometimes the perspective doesn't come out all at once. That's great. That's really great. Really helpful. So um, as we wrap up, um, I want to suggest two kinds of movement, um, two shifts that uh, are key to dialing in to this robust and enduring sense of meaning, irrespective of what you have to do on a day-to-day basis. So the first is to shift from secular to sacred, and that's the most important one, um, I, we think, because that's what unlocks the meaning in, in your work, no matter what you have to do on a day-to-day basis. And um, it's not enough to listen to somebody say, well, you get to do your work for God and with God. And I mean, some of you might be interested in some of that. You may write it down. Uh, but we have to find ways to spiritually form ourselves and form ourselves as we enter the workspace and engage in our work so that we're reminded of those things and we learn to look for those things. And we, and I, and I know that's what you're, that's the beauty of Faith and Work Chicago and the opportunities you are all offered there. Um, but it's huge. It takes, it's a process of reformation um, or discipleship, like Sarah said, that we have to be reschooled because even if, even when we could sometimes come from a faith background, we're just not really taught how to see our work this way um, at all. And so we need to, that's a spiritual discipline, spiritual community process, shifting from secular to sacred. And then the other shift is shifting from chore to treehouse. And I, at least, you know, I'm from New York. I'm cynical. I don't think you get a hundred percent Nobody gets 100% treehouse. Um, um, maybe in Brooklyn, I don't know, but not not the rest of New York City. Um, so I think that. So I think we visit it. I think we experience it. I think we taste it. Um, and the shift there, though, is to understand yourself and how God has made you, so you understand what is treehouse work for you. Um, so I'm. I know I'm. It's feedback. It's assessment. So forth. I'm an entrepreneur. I love building things taking it from an idea, getting it started. I don't really like managing it after I've made it. That becomes a chore. Um, But I know that. And I can dial into that, just click into that gear, and I can find ways to apply that strength to lots of different things in my work and even outside my work and some of the other organizations and things that I do. And so I I know what that is, and I I can sort of lean into it when it's appropriate and I don't know, kind of get a, maybe this is a bad, bad way to think about it, but get a treehouse fix. That's just back to be, wanting to be fulfilled. Sorry, I'm breaking our own rules. But I, I think it's, I think there's a sense though, if you know, this is how I made, this is my, these are my greatest contributions. This is the kind of situations that are going to be flow for me or treehouse for me that you can, you can use that information to your advantage, both in your daily work and um, in the other things that you do uh, to build God's kingdom. I, you know, um, one of the things that we would advocate as coaches is you use your stronger areas to na- deal with your weaker areas. So I use my treehouse strengths to deal with the parts of my work that are a chore, and then they're not quite as much of a chore, and I'm using what I've learned. So anyway, those are the two big shifts, moving from secular to sacred, and then also moving sort of from chore to treehouse, or at least understanding and being really clear, what is my treehouse zone and how, to, how can I get there? as often as possible. Closing thoughts, Sarah and Ken, and then we're going to actually go to an interview. Yeah, we'll let people think about questions while we're doing the interview. Um, I, I appreciate how you highlighted that um, nobody gets 100% treehouse, right? You know, work has been affected by the fall. And so we're not going to live in that zone of flow all the time. There, it's not always going to feel like treehouse. Um, and when 60% of your work puts you in flow, that's a really good split on job satisfaction, 60, 40, like that, uh, you know, people in our industry talk about that's like the pinnacle when you can get 60% in flow and 40% feels like chore or drudgery. Um, And so I think that's also important to keep in mind that we're not missing out on God's best for us if we don't always love our job or love our work. Um, It is that mix of growth and gift of chore and treehouse when we're partnering with God. Yeah, and, and let's say one positive thing about fulfillment here after, after saying some negative things about it, that it's not all of everything. I think there's a natural 
alignment between fulfillment and the impact that we have in the world, right? So it's not just that chip that you want to be more in flow all the time for selfish reasons. The truth is when you're building things the way no one else can build them in a way that really serves people, like we, we all benefit and you know that. And so your desire to benefit in the world in the way of using your superpowers or your strengths, I think is actually smart. And it's, it's part of the internal um, system that God puts in us to, to navigate us to the work that he wants us to do. Absolutely. I mean, God has put us on this earth to represent him. To represent means to present again God. And God is full of joy and full of um, satisfaction and full of delight and, and God works. So I think, you know, when we move into flow or into treehouse work, we experience that gift. It's another way to represent him here on earth. Yeah. Well said. So uh, at VOCA, one of the things that we've done is we've created an experience. It's a 10 part uh, coaching experience called the career navigator, which really helps every participant make these two shifts. Um, the shift from um, secular to sacred, it's reinforced throughout. This is a God journey. This is following him. This is more about him than it is about us. And also that shift from chore to treehouse, really helping every participant understand themselves and how that, where their treehouse tasks or top, top treehouse activities meshes with demand in the market. So it's called the Career Navigator. And uh, Harrison Gibbons, who's from Chicago, one of you, uh, has been participating in that. And so we're going to just bring him on and uh, have a little conversation with him. And I think, uh, Melissa, you're going to lead that. So great. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Gosh, I really love that, uh, that two by two. I think that's really helpful. And I really love thinking about treehouse work. Um, I think those are really helpful categories uh, for us to think about. So thank you guys for um, kind of reframing, I think, some of the way we think about meaning in our work. Um, what we want to let you guys know about, we have been so grateful for some early partnership work with Focus Center. We're really looking forward to more in the future. Uh, and one way that our network has benefited already, uh, as, as Chip mentioned, is through the Career Navigator cohort. And Harrison Gibbons, who is one of our Burnham Fellowship alumni, uh, has been involved with Faith and Work Chicago for a bit, is currently part of Ken's Career Navigator Group. And so I wonder, actually, if we could start with Ken, could you just tell us a little bit more about the program? Sure. Well, the program is really designed to help people navigate to the work that God has for them to do. And it's really in three parts. In the beginning, we actually say we slow down to go fast. We actually take time in the beginning. The first third of the program is about personal assessment. So you're figuring out what are your natural abilities we use an abilities battery assessment for that. We also do 360 assessment where you find out how other people are experiencing you and where they think your strengths lie at work. So there's a lot of um, personal discovery. In the second third of the program, we do what we call messaging, how to communicate to other people what you've discovered about yourself and turn that into a message that other people can use to help you, whether it's understanding the value you bring or understanding the target. What are you looking for? If you're in jobs transition, what would be a good transition for you? And having real clarity about that and practicing that and having a, a bunch of people giving you feedback is gonna be strengthening your messaging skills. And then finally, it's all about getting out there and doing information interviews and job um, applications and, and negotiating and landing that next job. And so all three parts of the program are very important, but they're different from each other. And it kind of takes you on this journey from uh, what should I be doing? And what should my perspective be uh, to a place where you know who you are, you know what you want, you know why it's a good fit or not a good fit so you can navigate opportunities. And then you can really make that really nice uh, fit with that new opportunity by um, negotiating and bringing yourself into that new company culture. That's a fantastic offering. And Harrison, I know that you've shared with me already how impactful the Career Navigator has been for you. Could you just tell us maybe a quick highlight and how this has been, how you've seen it be beneficial for you? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, just a little bit of like personal backstory. Uh, I was laid off from my last job uh, about two months before the pandemic hit in 2020. Um, and it was kind of uh, mercy at, at the moment because I was really unhappy in uh, my last work environment. And it was so, so much so that I actually was considering entirely shifting careers because I was just kind of, I didn't have any uh, frame of reference that perhaps maybe I just needed kind of like a different setting in which to be doing the same work. Um, so fortunately, uh, when I came across Career Navigator, entirely independent of Faith and Work Chicago, but it's just God's providence that these two kind of areas of my uh, uh, life of faith and work have kind of intersected. Um, <laughs> it's been a really incredible experience to, um, through a Christian framework, apply a lot of what uh, Ken was talking about, like uh, opportunities for self insight and opportunities um, to not only understand where I bring value, um, but also to understand how to tell others that I bring value and help me kind of understand where, where do I want to bring the value that I have so that, you know, I can kind of get as close to that, you know, that sacred, um, that, that gift space on that chart we were just looking at, like, how do we find that place where I'm most in flow or as close as I can get to it and be uh, operating in, with a sacred mindset as much as possible. So that way I can avoid the traps of, you know, looking for any port in a storm uh, in my job search. Mm -hmm. And it's been really interesting. I was telling Ken last night, like, this has actually been the most fun I've ever had uh, searching for a job. And it's, it, I never would have expected that, but coming just about to come out of the career navigator, it's been an incredible blessing. Well, that's fantastic. That's so encouraging to hear. I love that. Ken, how could people who are on this call or who are involved in our network get plugged into a career navigator cohort or, or get more information about this? Sure. So we actually have two versions of the program. There's a cohort that starts tomorrow night and there's a link in the chat that it looks like Sarah just put in. You can go to vocacenter.org slash career navigator. And tomorrow night, um, I will be leading a cohort starts at eight o'clock Eastern, seven o'clock central time. And it'll be an hour every week for a series of weeks. And then it goes to every other week at the end as you have more uh, getting out time in your life. So um, you can sign up on the line and join us tomorrow night if you want, if you want to be in a cohort. The second version of the Career Navigator is an individual program. You'll see that on the website. And the individual program uses the same basic curriculum and structure and the same online learning management system for watching the videos and going through the exercises and so on. The difference there is you get individual coaching. So it's a little bit more um, directed by you. It's more paced by you. You get more special attention by a coach working with you. The cost is higher. Um, so there's a pros and cons to either way. So if you find yourself wanting the individual attention, you can go online and sign up for that and, and we'll consult you through that. If you want to be in a group setting, it's, it's the lower cost point and there's no better time to jump in. You can jump in right now by starting with us tomorrow night. We run new cohorts every month and the coaches on the, on the call here rotate uh, through those cohorts. Fantastic. It's such a great opportunity. And uh, thank you, Harrison, for, for just sharing a little bit of your experience. Awesome, and thank you. Um, yeah, we're so, so thankful um, to be able to, to help make these connections and partnership and, and offer you something. I think that's really great and very practical uh, and helpful. So yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, Jeff, I'm going to turn it back over to you. But I think we're also at a point to, to take some questions. Uh, if anybody wants to drop any in the chat. So you get, yeah, certainly if you have any questions about the navigator or just um, any of the stuff that we talked about uh, in terms of finding meaning um, in our work, uh, anything about the, um, uh, the two by two or the presentation. You know, Sarah asked some good questions earlier about how you've seen work as a gift or as a grind. I'd love to, yeah, answer any more questions that come out of that. Well, so where do you see this linking with what you guys are doing in Faith and Work Chicago? 
because I didn't see a chat. I didn't see a conversation or a, a question, so I thought I'd just ask you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sure. Put you <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> no. Um, uh, with uh, the presentation or the navigator? The presentation, that idea of the secular oh. and sacred approaches of work and yeah, I mean, I think absolutely um, to uh, to reframe how we understand our work from God's perspective, particularly as you kind of reference to cultural mandate or or how we understand what God is doing in the world and what we've been commissioned to do um, as His representatives. Um, but participating in that because of the fall, you know, is is going to uh, is not all going to be treehouse work. <laughs> um, and so it, it's such a matter of, of how we understand that. I think it's um, a lot of what we talk about as well uh, and, and want to help dig into um, understanding the, the big story of what God is doing in the world and what it means to, to be human um, and be a part of that. Uh, but yeah, I, I love the, the picture of, of how we think about it um, and what that actually means for us day to day. Great. Very cool. Uh, Harrison, did you, sorry, I, I see you had a note in there. Yeah, sure. No, I actually, like, I, I really love that question. And I, I kind of wanted to, um, to jump in on there, that too, real quick. Um, so just as it also an opportunity to plug the upcoming Burnham Fellowship, because I've had the benefit uh, and the pleasure of going through that program, what I think that does, and, and it kind of, it very much ties into the work of Faith and Work Chicago is, um, it lays uh, a kind of a foundational groundwork for thinking about, okay, well, why do we even get into those places of thinking about work as a grind or as a God? And what is our, like, in what ways do we functionally uh, believe things that lead, that like will pull us, you know, kind of have like the gravitational pull into those mindsets and how can we as Christians, how can we really um, unearth the theology that's in God's word and that, you know, the church has, um, you know, developed over the course of the centuries to help us actually restory uh, what it means to be a believer um, to be a child of God, to be an adopted child of God, and what implication does that have for our work? So if I, you know, if I'm working for me, by me, is there a way in which, like, that's based out of a unspoken belief that God, you know, has orphaned me and actually doesn't care about me or something yeah. like that? So I think, like, the way that those things all tie together um, are really, really like I, to me, that's how uh, the work of faith, the work of faith and work Chicago, and the work of Vogue Center, just kind of like really are like a, a they mesh so well. Mm. Wow, Harrison, appreciate the yeah making connections as you've been awesome. a part of both both programs. Um, yeah, I, I see some good questions coming in to me, and then uh, in the chat, Beth Ann asks, sharing any insights or tips um, about noticing meaning in our in our daily work, uh, especially when we're kind of in that chore space. Um, any any formation or, or spiritual habit kind of practices that are, are maybe um, helpful for you in that? I think there's some language that uh, people are using called uh, workplace liturgies. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, Beth Ann, the idea of saying a prayer right before you answer an email, I think, is an example of one. And it's kind of a tiny habit practice, too, right? Like, it just really starts to, I mean, we know now that those types of activities really start to rewire their brains, our brains. Um, so I think that, yeah, I've heard, I've heard, you know, some, some other ideas are, and it's weird now, because we're most many of us are working remotely, but like, when you go to work, and when you come back, or when you enter your virtual working space and when you leave there could be uh, there could be a pause to pray there could be um, a commitment um, you know and asking for God's wisdom and power um, one of the things that my dad used to do this was not like this was not so much a like everyday kind of thing it was more like as needed he would actually tell us like when we were a little boy my brother and I when we were little boys at the dinner table he'd just talk about I just remember him saying well you really need to pray for your dad because I've got a tough problem at work and my dad worked with steel he was a material scientist so um actually most of his issues were actually with people not with the steel but um either but it, i just it still 
strikes me that he would say that first of all, and that he would say, pray for me. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we are very strong in advocating is that we need to, we need to lean into our spiritual community as we approach our work. And so those will be a couple ideas. Ken and Sarah, do you guys have some ideas? Yeah, I, have, I have a quick one. I know Sarah probably does too. <clears throat> Going back to my chore example, when I was in college and I was working with these documents and I was just seeing it as a series of apparently pointless tasks of formatting all this code. And to stop and say, who's gonna benefit from this work and how will they benefit from this work? And to have a vision that what I was actually doing is helping the English department run smoothly, get quick access to the stuff so they could stay in flow, so they could be effective in their job. There's a lot of meaning and value in that. And I didn't always see that. It was there, but I wasn't always conscious of it. And so just pausing, she's asking about what can we do to remember or notice, pausing and say, who benefits from this and how? And how can that be an offering to God? I can. I love that higher vision of sort of lifting our eyes to see what might be the bigger narrative at play. What, what might God be doing? You know, um, and, and Chip, my dad had some practices that I remember him talking about um, that helped lift his eyes. He always, um, he kept a little journal of um, divine moments when, when God made those divine moments at work. And he, uh, he would talk about how, you know, if, if he had to make an important phone call and the other person actually picked up the phone, <laughs> you know, when he had to get work done, that's a, that's a divine connection right there. The person he needed at the right time was available to pick up the phone. Like, <laughs> when does that happen these days? You know, or the, or the prompt response or um, thinking of the right person to contribute um, to a project you're working on. Or, or pushing through and getting to breakthrough, right? When you when you stay in chore work long enough that it moves to treehouse, that the growth work moves into flow. So I, I think there's something about keeping a journal of those moments. Um, and, and another practice, you, you talked about it, be, before you walk into your workspace, whether it's an office or a homework, homework space, you know, when I walk through that door, it's, it's a moment to pause uh, for me to pray and invite God. Um, and then there's also the, the keeping your Bible on your desk, whether it's at an office where people can see a physical Bible at your workspace or, um, or in your, your virtual space to, be, to just put your hand on it um, as a physical act of, Lord, I need you, Lord, I'm dependent on you before you write an email or move into a brainstorming session or move into a, a meeting that stresses you out. There's something about physically leaning on the Lord um, for support. So Bethann, those are a couple habits that, um, that have been helpful for me. Two more ideas. We'll keep, sure. we can keep running with this. I think, um, Ken, you mentioned uh, the, how it was helpful to think about who benefited from your work and something that I've done with um, like, CEOs of small companies that we just start talking about. Some of you have probably heard of a stakeholder map, uh, but it's really, I ch let's change the terminology. Let's call it a neighbor map. Who are the neighbors who I interface with in my work on a day-to-day -day basis? I start to think about it that way. I found a lot of us don't think about our colleagues or our vendors or definitely not our superiors as our neighbors. And we don't use that language. And so, uh, and that's a writing exercise. Another writing exercise is to think through, we said, you know, there's three ways we can join God in our work, creative work, uh, protective or redemptive work and providing work and to figure out how does my work mesh with those themes? You know, I, a lot of my clients are in finance and they actually do all three. Um, you know, they're, they're coming up with new ways to invest money and make money. They're guarding their clients from risk and they're providing, particularly as people think about saving for the future, they're providing. So that's, that's, that hits all three. And to realize, well, God is doing those things in the world and I'm joining him. I think there's a little bit of like, we just need to do some intentional dot connecting and maybe a little bit bigger level. That might be helpful too. That's a really great question. Um, and uh, as you can tell, cause we all wanted to talk about it. For <laughs> so. it is, yeah, no, I, I agree. That's a fantastic question. And I, I do think thinking about those, um, those daily liturgies is a, is a really intentional habit. I, I, many of you probably are familiar with a book called The Common Rule by Justin Whitmill Early. I find that to be a really helpful, practical. Uh, it's actually one that we do use in the Burnham Fellowship 
um, to, to help us think about different liturgies. And one that I've always appreciated and don't do well, but it's a, a kneeling prayer, morning, afternoon, and evening. Um, and I think the, the physical act of getting on your knees and, and giving your day to the Lord and your work to the Lord um, as, it, as you start uh, midday is, is really an amazing time to stop and reflect on the work that you've been doing, kind of reset your mind, rethink about you know, what's ahead um, even if that's finding, you know, a, a window to look out and you know, maybe just open your hands and, and, and speak to the Lord if you can't get on your knees and in your office space, but, uh, and then one at the end of the day to, to, to rest and to turn over all, all the work um, that you have done and to call it a good day and to trust the Lord with work that you feel is left undone, um, I think are all really, those have been great practices too, I think, to kind of um, reorient our minds, you know, uh, throughout the course of the day. I find those to be really helpful. I did have another question come in that I think is um, a good one to ask. Uh, and maybe it's just a bit of a, a reflection on why, uh, why do you think that fulfillment is a primary way in which we evaluate our work? Kind of how are we in that space? Um, I think what's, yeah, countercultural about maybe what we're talking about. Uh, any thoughts you guys have on that? Yeah, I, I think it's because we're Americans in the 21st century. This is our culture. It's a me culture. It's a happiness culture. It's a you do you culture. Uh, if there's any reason to make a change, it's because you're not happy and you want to be happy. And that's just another way of saying, I want to be fulfilled in my job. Um, if you ask young people today, why do they want to go into a particular career? It would be shocking for a high percentage of them to say, well, this is what the world really needs right now. And I feel like the discipline and effort that I put into is gonna help people, you know, with, no, it's not like that. It's like, this is what I'm good at. This is what I like. I really like helping people. or I really like doing this kind of work. And so that's what's motivating me. And I feel like in many ways we're adolescent as a culture. Um, we've never gotten past that idea that I should be making decisions based on how I feel. Yeah, Ross Douthat has a really interesting piece. It was in Sunday's New York Times. Um, he's a Catholic thinker and writer. He's really good. And he, he just said, being, auth like, being authentic and fulfilled is like the highest moral good of our age. And so we've just been schooled in it, formed in it from Disney since we were all in diapers. Um, and we just can't imagine actually volunteering to do something that's hard or unpleasant, like for any length of time. And I think there's an irony in that. It's sort of like, you know, all the commercials for food that make this food look really good, but then there's all the commercials for like losing weight and being healthy. And um, there's a, our culture gives us this impossible message, actually, this impossible standard that's really actually ends up being a burden. But um, so we're, you know, we're told do whatever makes you happy. But we also, the people that we most admire, like athletes and even actors, a lot of them work really, really hard. Um, and we, we downplay a lot of that. So I think we're, we're being lied to basically is really the bottom line. I think it's really insightful. Uh, and I think it's so important to just be um, uh, cognizant of the messages that we're getting in our culture and where they're coming from all the time and to sort of red flag those <laughs> when we see them. Uh, otherwise, it's so easy for us to just get caught up in those in those same messages. But I think when we can have the dialogue and the conversation, when we can be aware um, of what we're what we're being fed in a sense um, in an attempt to counter that with what what does the gospel say uh, is a really important practice and and one to do in community for sure. Mm. Um, well, I think, yeah, I think we'll, we'll end there. And uh, this has been really great. I, I hope that um, this has been helpful in, uh, in sort of reframing our thinking, uh, maybe giving us some new categories to think about. Um, hopefully uh, some of you might even check out the, the career navigator um, to take some next steps uh, in this. I think there's so much practical, um, so much practical stuff here. Uh, thanks, um, Sarah, for dropping that webinar information uh, in the chat. Um, uh, once again, I'll, I'll send an email uh, after this with a, a link to, to watch um, again and with some of these uh, links that have been provided 
Um, I know again, tomorrow night is, uh, is the start of the next um, career navigator cohort. Uh, I believe that's like an orientation uh, even that you can, you can check out if I understood right. Um, so yeah, I uh, hope that, um, yeah, these are just some valuable tools for you. Our desire really is to, um, is to help all of us rethink um, how we think about our work uh, to push back on some of those, those cultural narratives um, and also to, to, again, to do that in community. So uh, hopefully this has been, been helpful for you. Uh, Chip, Ken, Sarah, thank you guys so much once again. It's just, yeah. uh, it's a joy. It's, it's really enjoyable uh, to hear from you and, and to learn along with you. So we hope that you'll join us again uh, next week, everyone. Uh, we'll be back uh, talking about um, uh, the building blocks of vocation. I think they're a calling. I think that'll be a, a great time as well. So same link, uh, same time. Hope to see you there. So have a good afternoon, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a Thank great you. week. Thank you.